So let me introduce you uh, to our guest, uh, Lawrence Claes. He is a science writer. He is an amateur astronomer. And he knows everything about the history of SETI. He was an editor <laughs> of SETI Quest, a magazine devoted specifically to SETI. But what is SETI? Well, here I step back and let Larry run the show and tell you everything <clears throat> about it. Thank, thank you very much, Julia. Um, I, I uh, welcome to everyone who's here. And for all those who are moms, happy Mother's Day. Appreciate you being here. And everyone can hear me, I've been told. So uh, let's start. Uh, as the title of the lecture says, this is the quest for galactic minds, the history of SETI. Now, um, Julia told me that you recently had another lecture about astrobiology, and that's great because it gives you the foundation for what I'm gonna be discussing next, which is, uh, the search, the actual searching for alien life, and in particular, intelligent alien life, or what we think is. Now, just to get started off, what is SETI? Well, SETI is a, the term that stands for the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. It involves humanity's attempts to find other thinking beings in the Milky Way galaxy and beyond. Now, the reason I'm differentiating here is we've also done searches on other worlds, so a minor degree, for alien life that we don't consider to be conscious, aware, intelligent. I mean, all living creatures have some intelligence, but I'm talking about beings like us and certainly more advanced who are aware of their surroundings of themselves, uh, use some form of technology, and hopefully with SETI are actually communicating out into space trying to find other intelligent beings. So this is what I'm differentiating here between searching for alien life and searching for intelligent alien life. And SETI is a, there's, there are institutions called SETI. There's the SETI Institute in California, but SETI's a general term for searching for extraterrestrial intelligence, as well as it's not one monolithic operation. It's actually many, there's many groups. There's many different groups around the world conducting SETI, which is nice because 20, 30 years ago, there were very few and they were struggling, but things have changed as you'll see. Um, there's another term uh, that we'll be discussing too, it's called METI, it's more, it's a newer one. It's also known as active SETI, but I prefer the term METI and METI, which stands the mess messaging to extraterrestrial intelligence. Now, what this means is that some scientists think it isn't just enough to listen or look because it's a huge universe. There's 400 billion star systems in our Milky Way galaxy alone, and there's 2 trillion galaxies in the known universe. Um, we don't stand out very much, despite what you might see in the movies, and not everybody's coming to visit us like the movies would like to have you think. So some scientists have said we should be sending out our own signals. Now we already have, we have last 100, 100 or so years, we've been inadvertently broadcasting radio, television and radar signals into the universe. They just, it's called electromagnetic leakage. And it just expands as this huge bubble of electromagnetic signaling leaving our earth, which is about 200 light years across so far because it moves at the speed of light. Radio and light move at the same speed, which is 186,000 miles per second. So some scientists have said we should be sending signals out there deliberately aimed at certain star systems or what have you to get their attention. Now, of course, this has brought up a lot of debate. Some think it's a great idea. Some think it's a danger. I mean, we don't know yet, because obviously we don't know if there's any other intelligent beings out there. We have no scientific proof. So we don't know who's out there, how they might respond. I mean, the hope is that if you're more advanced than us, you will know, you will uh, feel fine about Medi and other people are very wary. Um, and you know, can't blame either side. So now that we know the term SETI and Medi, um, 
let's look into the history of how it all began. How, did, how, how have we been searching for intelligent life elsewhere? Now, you might think it's a recent development, but it actually goes much further back than you might imagine. First of all, the ancient Greeks over 2,000 years ago were the first one to consider the, even the possibility that there were intelligent beings living on other worlds in our universe. Now, nobody was trying to signal or anything, but they were aware of um, they were aware of the possibility that there could be life in other planets besides Earth. Um, where, where what we would consider the the beginning, the seeds of modern SETI actually began in the late 19th century. Uh, Letty, I'm okay, so an, an astronomer named uh, Giovanni Schiaparelli noticed what he saw on the planet Mars that looked like these straight lines going all over the planet. And he called them canali, which in Italian means channels. Um, but it was interpreted elsewhere as canals. Now there's some interesting things to note. In, the, in that time period, the human, uh, human civilization was just starting to build these big canals, the Suez Canal, they were planning to do the Panama Canal to connect the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. And Mars at the same time was considered a definite possibility for a planet that could have life. Now, if you, if you knew what a 19th century astronomer knew about Mars, it, bore, it had a lot of similarities to Earth from the distance that we couldn't see it any closer than 35 million miles, but we could make out the following. It has, it is smaller than Earth, about half the size, um, but it has 20, it has a, a same axial tilt as ours, just about. It has almost the same day as Earth. It's only 40 minutes longer. Uh, it has two polar caps, just like we do, the Arctic and Antarctic, as you, as you can see in this drawing here. And it had light and dark markings, which the astronomers of the day interpreted as seas and land. So Mars, of all the planets in the solar system, looked, and, and being the fourth from the sun, looked a lot like Earth. So therefore, they thought it was a pretty good chance it could have some kind of life and maybe even more than just animals or plants, but intelligent beings. Now, when Schiaparelli discovered these canals, uh, a lot of people's imaginations got fired up. And before you knew it, they, were, they immediately took them as... The Martians are building giant canals to connect the, wa the get water from the poles and bring it to their cities on the equator. And the funny thing is, the more canals they, the more, the more they looked, the more people looked and were convinced, the more canals they saw. And this is a, a representative map of what people saw in the 19th century. Now, what was really going on was, these were natural, as we found out 100 years later when we started sending probes there, these were natural land features, but from millions of miles away, they were blurry at best and the human eye and then the brain interpreted them as lines because our brains tend to do that. So it was from that step to there that Mars wasn't only inhabited, but there were intelligent beings building canals. And they thought it would be a wonderful idea to communicate with them. And the late 19th century also brought up a few other possibilities for doing this. Um, one, uh, that the people of the 19th century thought they could uh, communicate with the, the beings on Mars was by ra the new invention of radio. They thought and hoped because if these beings made canals, they should also have radio. Therefore, they might be able to signal us or we can signal them. And... Uh, some people also came up with the idea of in the Sahara Desert or in some remote area of America to build these huge machines with these big white cloths that could be mechanically operated to signal Morse code at Mars. Another idea, which I couldn't find a good picture of, was um, they would actually make huge trenches in the Sahara Desert, fill them with oil and set them on fire. And these would be in geometric shapes to show the Martians that we were intelligent enough to know geometry and to please contact us. 
And the culture at the time was quite enamored with the signaling Mars. In fact, if you look at the um, item on the right, there's a, um, there is a uh, sheet music about signaling Mars. And you can actually look it up and hear it on YouTube. So this was, and in 19, just to show how far this got, in 1924, radio operators around the world were asked to put, make radio, radio was just starting out in the 20s. They were asked for radio silence because Mars was at its closest to Earth that year. And they wanted to know if perhaps if Mars, if Mars astronomers were watching, they knew we were both close and they thought perhaps we could signal. So they were hoping Mars might signal us. Now, apparently everybody did this really happen. They did do radio silence. A few radio operators said they picked up some unusual signals, but the chances are pretty good. It wasn't from Mars because as we now know, Mars definitely does not have intelligent beings on it, unless you count some of our robot rovers. But in 19, even in the early 20th century, they weren't certain and they were still trying to find out. But these were, this was the beginning of what we would call SETI today. But it didn't catch on for a number of more decades. Now, why was this? Well, there's a reason. Because another thing built up in the beginning of the 20th century was science fiction and in the mid 20th century, uh, reports of UFOs, aka flying saucers. Now, these stories were clever and inventive, but they were usually... Uh, not always the, in the greatest mediums. The movies that came out about aliens were usually pretty silly and junky. And UFO reports uh, were definitely not under what science would consider scientific. It would be people reporting stories. Sometimes they may turn out to be uh, illusions or hoaxes or misinterpretations. There was never any serious physical evidence. So you, aliens were not considered widely respected. And as a result, scientists were avoiding them like the plague. So nobody was really trying to do anything we would call SETI, even though, and, and, and of course, by then they also realized there were probably no intelligent beings on Mars. They thought there might be intelligent beings in other worlds and other star systems, but they're really far away. So SETI was definitely at a low point in the mid, early and mid 20th century after the big excitement over Mars. Uh, but then this guy, Mr. Frank Drake, who's celebrating his 90th birthday on May 28th this month, uh, decided he, realizing with uh, the relatively new science of radio astronomy, that he could, um, you know, hope, listen for if anyone out there was signaling with anyone in the gal local galaxy was sending radio signals and they happened to be heading towards Earth that he could pick them up. Radio, uh, while not perfect, is a great way to send signals across the galaxy. It is, you, you don't need to be terribly advanced to do it. It doesn't, it does involve large equipment, but it's nothing undoable. And the signal can spread far and wide. So it's not perfect, it has its flaws, but it's, it's a pretty, it's a relatively easy medium to use for things like SETI, for, communi for communicating across the galaxy. So in 19, <coughs> excuse me, in 1960, Frank Drake uh, began what he called Project Ozma. He was given time on this radio telescope you see that still exists down in West Virginia and he spent two months, oh, and Ozma, by the way, is the name of a princess of a faraway magical land in the Wizard of Oz stories. He thought it was a perfect name. So for two months, he listened with his radio telescope. Now, what happened was when he started in 1960, the, the first day he started, he picked up some signals that did not seem to match anything. And he's like, could it be this easy? Is the galaxy teeming with people sending radio signals everywhere and we just didn't know because we weren't tuned in? So he was pretty excited, as you can imagine, but also extremely cautious because one thing SETI scientists have to do is be really careful uh, because our, our Earth is very radio noisy and it's very easy to make mistakes. And they don't want to do that because they would, they would lose credibility and what have you. 
and they'd be chasing the wrong thing. Turned out it was very likely a military jet because even though astronomers have agreements that, because there's also a lot of natural radio noise in the universe and it's hard to, to, it's called a needle in a haystack, trying to find the artificial amongst all the natural noise because our universe on the radio scale is incredibly noisy. So he checked it out and it turned out it was very likely a military jet that had flying in the area. And what happened is even though the radio astronomers have rules about people staying off certain frequencies that they study as radio astronomy with, um, people often ignore it, including of course the military. But even though Frank did not find alien, any alien life and his project only lasted a couple months and he was only checking out two nearby stars that look sunlight, um, he got the ball rolling and it started the, this, this is the man who started the modern area, era of Radio SETI. Uh, Frank Drake, as you might also know, is the fellow who came up with in 1961, which is known as the Drake Equation. Uh, what it is, it's a linear, it's a straightforward mathematical formula for determining how many intelligent technological civilizations are in the galaxy. And what he does is he takes how many stars are there, then he divides it, uh, multiplies it by, or divides, excuse me, then he takes how many uh, those suns are stars are sun-like, then how many might have planets, then how many might have planets that are Earth-like, then how many have planets where the light, life might form, then how many have life that's intelligent, and then how many might be intelligent enough to do things like make radio telescopes, and then you have to divide it by how long that technological civilization will last. Now, of course, there's a lot of guessing here, a lot of guessing, even though we've gotten better than in 1961. For example, we now are pretty sure almost every star in the Milky Way galaxy has a system of planets. Doesn't mean they all have life, but there are now 400 billion stars around in our galaxy, almost all of them have planets. So that definitely increases the odds of life elsewhere. But there are still many parts of this formula we, or equation we do not know. Um, and there's, there are places you can go online, you can play the, you can put in numbers and play with it. And of course, now he, Frank Drake himself put in numbers and he didn't get many, like he got like 10,000 civilizations. Other people have played with it and gotten a million, other people have gotten zero. We still have a long way to go, but it's a start, it's a foundation. But it's an, the Drake equation is a very, it's a good way to start making some good guesses about who or what's out there or not. Now, um, the 60s did have, through the 60s, there were a few SETI programs, but it wasn't very big, but it was a start. The 70s are when things started to really kick off. Now, I always love pointing this out because this is a little known, um, this is a little known part of SETI history that very few people know about. And I was wonderfully surprised when I did. Um, in the early 70s, America and the Soviet Union were sending uh, probes to Mars. Well, in 1973, the Soviet Union sent four probes to Mars, two landers and two orbiters. Mars, they were called Mars 4, 5, 6, and 7. 6 and 7 were, had landers. See the, con the conical um, up piece atop? That is the lander on top of the, the Soviet Mars probe. And this one called Mars 7 had an extra little uh, bit of scientific equipment and it was actually conducting SETI, optical SETI, not looking for radio signals, but laser and ultraviolet signals. Uh, never had been done before. It was not well known. I, I'm really sorry. It should have gotten out in the news, but things were different then. And so this probe, while it was heading to land on Mars and look for life, was conducting SETI. Uh, did not find any as far as we know. And unfortunately, poor Mars 7, when it um, ejected its lander to land on the red planet, it the 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 software, the, the, the computer chips on these Mars probes had serious technical problems that weren't discovered until it was too late. And unfortunately, Mars 7 missed the entire planet. So 
uh, Mars 7 is, and its lander is still out there orbiting the sun way out by Mars. Um, and it, so it, it, it didn't achieve that mission, but it did conduct the very first SETI from space. And I always love telling that just because I think that's something more people get need to know about. So that was one aspect of things picking up with SETI in the 70s. Uh, we were also doing forms of METI regarding space probes. Remember METI messaging to extraterrestrial intelligence. Uh, this fellow here holding this plaque, his, uh, this name Carl Sagan. Uh, you may or may not know him, the Cosmos series that's been out now, that's by Neil deGrasse Tyson. Um, they've talked about him. He started the original Cosmos program in 1980. Uh, it's all on YouTube, and I highly recommend it. Uh, I also wanted to show Carl because he was one of the big people back then that was really pushing for SETI and, ex and exobiology, as they also call it, um, when it was still not highly regarded by the, in the scientific and, and uh, academic communities. He's the one who really started turning it around. Well, one of the things he did regarding a space probe was in 1972 and 73, um, the United States launched the Pioneer 10 and 11 space probes, which you can see down in the lower right. This is an artist representation of um, Pioneer 10 leaving Earth and heading past the moon. It wasn't, the moon wasn't really that close, but this is artistic license. Um, these were the first probes that were not only going to explore Jupiter and Saturn, they were also going to be the first probes to leave the entire solar system and head out into the wider galaxy, which had never happened before. Well, Carl Sagan and several others said, we should have some kind of gift or greeting or message on these probes in case somebody finds them someday. So he and Frank Drake, you may remember that name, and his wife, uh, who was an artist, Linda Salzman Sagan, designed the the plaque that you see him holding in his hands that's not that's a replica and what they did was um in in, in this this thing's only it's like it's the size of a large book and it's a thin it's made of aluminum um it's it's a steel and aluminum coated uh plaque and it, and it's, it was attached to the antenna struts in pioneer 10. so what they did was they left a greeting card and in the um see the spindly lines those are where pulse, those are um, shows where 14 pulsars are. And by matching the timings, you can figure out where Earth is. Uh, it also has a representation of a man and a woman. The man is raising his arms in greeting. Um, there's a, a diagram of the probe behind them to show how big we are compared to the probe. And if you look in the bottom, that's a, a map of our solar system. And it shows the Pioneer probe. Um, the trajectory from Earth uh, between Saturn and Jupiter and heading out into the galaxy. And there's other little details, but that's basically what they did was. So this is this would be considered uh, probably the first deliberate physical METI into the galaxy. Now, of course, the Pioneer probes are moving far, far slower than, um, they're moving far, far slower than radio waves. They're going to take millions of years to get towards the stars they were not deliberately aimed at. And of course, the probes themselves have long run out of power. So finding them is going to be rather difficult, but it's not, <coughs> uh, excuse me, it's not impossible. And uh, it's not impossible and you never know. So this was the first uh, greeting to the stars. Uh, sent to the Pioneer 10 and 11 probes by Mr. Carl, Dr. Carl Sagan. Uh, there were also other METI uh, through radio telescopes. And in 1974, the Arecibo Radio Observatory in Puerto Rico, and as you see, this is an aerial shot of it. Um, until recently, it was the largest radio telescope on Earth. China just built one called FAST, F-A-S-T, and it's double the size of this. Arecibo is 1,000 feet across. Um, it could hold 10 billion bowls of cornflakes. It could pick up a cell phone call on Venus. It's, it may not be the biggest anymore, but it's still pretty darn impressive. Well, you see all those, um, see the silvery area in the main part of the dish? The, it, those are aluminum plates. Uh, before then, it just had a Nesh bedding. Well, in 1974, 
um, the people running Arecibo Radio Observatory decided to put down aluminum plates all along the dish so it would be better at picking up signals and reflecting them. And in celebration, they decided to send out a three-minute radio message, message to the stars. Now, by the way, this was also written by Frank Drake. And he put it together, and on November 16, 1974, it was beamed into the galaxy. And this is what it looks like. Oh, sorry. This is, I, this is a beautiful, another shot of the Arecibo radio telescope. I threw it in just because I thought it was so beautiful. But that's looking up from the dish. And this is the message. This is what it looks like. Um, if you see it, you can, hopefully you can read the text, but just tell you, if you look from the top, it shows the binary numbers 1 to 10 because the radio signal was sent in binary. Then it shows our DNA structure. And then down the middle is probably the first thing you can recognize. It's a symbol of a human. Uh, to the left is how many people are on, uh, how many members of the species that sent the radio signal out exist. It was 4 billion in 1974. It's now almost 8 billion in 2020. Right below the, the human figure is the representation of our solar system. And notice they moved Earth up towards the human, hopefully to give them the hint that this is the planet we come from. And then down below, which could look like a very large squat person, is actually the radio telescope. Um, it's, basically, they sent the message in binary, and you have to decode it as the number of two primes, and then hopefully they'll figure it all out. But basically, this is... The, this is the message and this is what the symbolism meant. Now, where is this message going? It's actually headed towards the uh, globular star cluster called Messier 13, which is in the constellation of Hercules. And it's only 25,000 light years away. Um, so what that means is if there's anybody in that huge cluster of stars and they pick up the signal and they respond right away, it's going to take another 25,000 years to get back. So what we sent in 1974, uh, if there is a message to come back, we won't hear for 50,000 years. Now, the astronomers, again, they don't know if there's anyone there. They don't know if anyone will respond. Um, part of this was largely symbolic and a celebration of the telescope being upgraded. But it was, again, the, one of the very first deliberate radio medi signals. It wasn't the very first, but it's the first prominent one. So who knows, in 50,000 years, we might get a response. Now, another interesting thing, now we weren't just all sending signals, we also picked up some. Um, as the SETI, the most SETI projects were all private, uh, universities, some individuals. Well, there was uh, one that, there was one signal that got picked up that has become legendary and it's known as the wow signal of 1977. So basically what and what you're looking at here is uh, basically a look below uh, the Ohio State University had a very large radio telescope. Now if you notice not all radio, radio telescopes are big and circular. This one's actually flat and has two uh, other parts of antenna at the other each end of its field. They had built it for radio astronomy, but also um, some of the folks at OSU also decided to do SETI with it. And at the time, it was one of the longest running SETIO programs in human history. Well, one day, in night, and what would happen is they'd pick up the signal, it would record signals on uh, paper, and later on, an operator would come and check to see if it picked up anything interesting. This was definitely the old days before super fast computers and storing, storing tons of data and everything like we have now. So one day this fellow was checking the printout and he noticed this on the paper. Now you notice most of the signals are just ones and threes and twos. Well, this really loud signal, these numbers don't mean anything. It's not a message. It's not code. It's just the computer interpret, it's the interpretation from the computer uh, picking a very high level of, of, of radio signal, a uh, signal number. 
Sorry, I'm not saying that right, but it's a very it's it's a very high number. It has nothing to. It's not a message or a signal from aliens per se. Well, this impressed him so much. If you look at the other numbers, he took his red pen and he circled it and he wrote "Wow" in the corner, because this was a very this was a very and it lasted 72 seconds. Well, as it turned out, they they did a search for it. It was not, as far as they know, it wasn't radio interference from anything, any human. Um, it wasn't tracked very long. And they, they asked, you know, the military and everything, did anybody happen to interfere at the time? Turns out they have, to this day, they still do not know what that signal is. It could have been interference, uh, who knows, but they have never found out who sent it or what sent it or why. They have searched in that area of the sky for a number of times ever since. It's never repeated. And this is an important thing to learn in SETI. Just like in science, where you have to repeat experiments, SETI has to be repeatable. You can get unusual signals like this, like the wow signal. But if you can't repeat it, it just, re it just remains an enigma. So there's no proof of where this came from, whether it's art, it's from humanity or extraterrestrial. And to this day, it, we, it's still a mystery, but it's one of the most famous sig SETI signals ever found. And it happened in the 70s when things were really starting to pick up. Also at this time in the 70s, uh, there was uh, publications devoted to SETI. There was, well, there weren't many. There were tons of UFO magazines but there was only one that came out in the late 70s. And it's called Cosmic Search, and it was put together by a lot of the radio SETI pioneers that we've, um, you know, like, like Frank Drake, for example. Uh, lasted 13 issues. What ha it was a very good magazine. Very, it's, all, it's also available online. Uh, it's great. It's a good sampling of the history of SETI at the time. What happened was um, the radio SETI astronomers found out how hard it is to try to publish a magazine and write articles and do their other work. So it only lasted 13 issues, but it's online and I highly recommend it. That's, by the way, that's the first and the last issues. But I wanted to point it out that amongst all the UFO and other silliness, there was a serious publication that was inspired by what was going on in the 70s as SETI grew. Uh, there's also an even more famous uh, probe delivering its own message to aliens in the 70s. You probably even heard of it. Uh, the Voyager 1 and 2 probes in 1977, they were launched from Earth to, be, to explore all of the outer planets from Jupiter to Neptune. And once again, because they were like the pioneer probes, because they were going to leave the solar system uh, Frank Drake and Carl Sagan and, and uh, John Lomberg and a few others said, let's put, let's put a message together. Well, this time they wanted to do more than a plaque. See the little gold disc below the, um, the radio end, the white big white radio, radio dish? Well, that little gold disc is the cover for this. This is the Voyager Interstellar Record. They put together a record um, that put together sounds, images, music, and languages representing the human race. And they only had six weeks to do it before the probe launched because NASA wasn't waiting. And to, if you look on the, the records on the right, you see where it says Sounds of Earth. And if you look on, and that's a regular, that's an LP, that's a reg, it's a record. It's, a, it's, a, it's made of metal, not uh, vinyl, but it's a real record. Um, and on the left is the cover with instructions for how to play it. Now, the interesting thing is the re a record has a beautiful aspect. It can be played without fancy instruments. They could have, they didn't have CDs in 1977, but if they did, they would have had to have sent equipment with it to be played and hopefully understood how to play it. With a record, if nothing else, you can spin it, put a needle in the groove, and you can at least hear the sounds, the music, and the languages. 
Um, now, if you're asking how can the aliens play it if they don't have a record player, well, the people putting Voyager together were kind enough to put a needle and a stylus with each Voyager. So if worse comes to worse, they can spin the disc and put the needle in and at least hear the sounds. But th what they're hoping is if these beings are advanced enough to find the Voyagers in deep space, that means they have interstellar travel, therefore they have advanced technology, and they should be able to figure out how to read and electronically interpret these records. Plus, they did give them, uh, as you can tell, picture, picture instructions on the cover. Um, so, and if you notice, look, if you look on the cover on the left, there's a big rectangle with a circle. If this was to tell the recipients that if they played this right, if they, if they reconstructed it right, the first image they would see is a circle. Very simple, but it, it shows them they're on the right track. It's easy to interpret. And it also shows them that the, um, the raster or the dimensions of the pictures are being done right because it's a circle. Now, what did they put aboard the Voyager Interstellar record? Uh, you can go online and see, hear in the music, uh, the, the, the sounds, the languages and everything, um, and the pictures. And I thought I would show you some of the pictures they put on. These are some of the images they put on. This is um, school children at the UN looking at a globe of the earth. Uh, this down there was uh, the first American spacewalk uh, by Ed White in 1965. Uh, they wanted to show our structures. This is the United Nations building at night. Uh, this is another group of children and it's, it's excellent because it shows uh, different faces, body positions, uh, different races, different the, the genders, gives a good representation of what we look like as a species. Uh, they also showed things how we, this was a deliberately done picture that they made, how we eat, drink, and lick ice cream. Uh, that's Jane Goodall studying chimpanzees in the wild. And of course, they put in a picture of our Earth that was actually taken by Apollo 11, the first mission to the moon, so they know what our planet looked like. Um, as I said, they also included a nice sampling of music, which I highly recommend you listen to, um, on the record. In fact, it takes up most of the record. And what they did is the last, this is the last image before the, the record goes to the music. So they show a violin and they show some sheet music. And then they also showed a picture of people playing instruments to hopefully get across to the recipients that that is music and this is how we uh, transcribe it, for lack of a better word. And you might ask yourself, why would they send music? I mean, people on Earth like all different kinds of music. How would the aliens even know what music is or why would they want to hear it? Well, the hope is music is, for us, for humans, even music is universal, at least on Earth. You could hear a piece of music that you've never heard before. You don't know who played it. You don't know what. It's totally different from your experience but you still recognize it as music and you know what music is, which is to interpret situations, feelings, news even, and make you feel something about it. And the hope is the, the recipients who are probably not humans or even dis our descendants, if they happen to find the probe someday, will still get that point. And if, if nothing else, it'll show something about us that perhaps it's unique and they'll learn something about us that we take music, music is a, is a form of language for us and we take it very seriously. So that's, that, that, like I said, that's one of the last pictures on the Voyager record. Well, the 80s, um, th there was SETI going on in the 80s, but it was a little, it wasn't like the Renaissance in the 70s. Uh, but there were some SETI programs going on. Uh, here's actually in 1985, um, Carl, Carl Sagan and the Planetary Society started Project Meta, um, which was listening to over a million radio signals in space. And they invited St the Steven Spielberg, who had just who had done ET, of course, to um, switch on the radio telescope so it could start listening for signals. 
And I've actually, that radio telescope behind them, I've actually been there when it was tilted upwards. I've actually been out on it. I actually was able to go out to the very edge of the dish. It's 85 feet up in the air. It was a wonderful experience. So yes, there was SETI going on in the 80s, but it wasn't doing too great. And part of the problem was NASA had been trying to get SETI funded for its own programs and Congress kept cutting them down. But all was not lost because in the 90s, SETI started another a second renaissance, as it were, or a third if you count the 60s. Um, there, radio is not, even though it's the most represented, it's not the only way to look for signals. Um, it's very likely aliens could be using other methods, and one possibility is optical. And what I mean by that is it's lasers and infrared and ultraviolet. And they could use very high powered beams aimed at Earth. And we, we would be, it would have to, unlike radio, it wouldn't be scattered, it'd be very concentrated. So they'd have to be deliberately sending to us. But we would detect the signal, it would look incredibly bright, like an incredibly bright star. Um, radio interference would do absolutely nothing to it. And the other beauty is, you can carry far more information, including video images, in a laser beam. So in the early 90s, um, optical SETI was, people who were promoting it were able to get it going, and it started, be, and by the late 90s, it became accepted as part of the SETI community. Because before then, radio SETI astronomers were very reluctant to support optical um, for reasons that were sometimes even kind of silly. They were saying that, well, humans can't do this, so therefore we can't detect it. And that's wrong. We could detect even if we didn't have powerful lasers, which we are now on our way to having for many reasons that I will show later. But optical SETI got its start in the 90s. It's now an acceptable and often same level part of radio SETI. Uh, there was also SETI at home. Uh, if you remember Arecibo, uh, it was uh, detecting a lot of, it was doing a lot of uh, ra regular radio astronomy. Well, they had tons and tons of data. So somebody decided to take all the radio signals from Arecibo and start studying it and looking if there were any artificial signals in and among all the natural signals. So in the, in the, in the 90s, in fact, this program literally just ended this year you could um, you could actually get packets of radio data on your computer and it would it would um, sift your computer in its idle time could sift through and see if there's any artific potential artificial signals in the radio astronomy data from Arecibo. And I used to do that for years. I don't know if I found anything, but um, it's been it was I think it was a very clever very clever idea and I've, i find i bet some people are still running it today even though it's officially over with but it's something i hope will be re revived and re uh, redone again because we definitely have re more real study programs oh another biggie that happened in the 90s we found that was a real stepping stone for SETI was we started detecting alien planets or also known as exoplanets uh, 95, in 1995, uh, astronomers announced the first planet found around a star like the sun. Now, a few years before, they had found some uh, alien planets, but they were around a pulsar, which is what's a neutron star, which is basically the remnants of a star that exploded. So even though it was nice to find planets, astronomers were not so certain there was any life on it because when a star explodes, Amongst other things, it would bathe those remaining surviving worlds in extreme radiation, and the neutron star that's left uh, isn't really very good at lighting and warming another planet. But in the 1995, about 10 years before they predicted, they started finding alien planets. And I can remember when that happened, and the numbers started slowly building up. Today, we now know of thousands of real alien worlds. And that's, and when astronomers realized that we were detecting planets just in the few narrow areas we've looked, they now realize there have to be planets probably around every star in the galaxy 
And who knows, maybe every st almost every star in every galaxy is planets. And since planets are where we think most life comes from, it definitely increases the odds. But that was another big thing in the 90s is that really boosted SETI is when we found started finding real alien planets. Now these, by the way, these pictures, these aren't actual images of those alien planets. Those are artists' interpretations. We've seen some cloud. We have seen, actually seen, we've made incredibly crude maps of a couple and actually mapped some of the cloud structure on a few alien planets. But we're a long way away from seeing anything up close. But it's a start. But we may, in the next 20, 30 years, we may have telescopes that can actually see continents and clouds and who knows what else on some of the alien worlds that we've, di we've discovered. Oh yeah, and in the 90s, uh, another SETI magazine came out, uh, the second one, which I was the editor and co-producer of called SETI Quest. And this is the cover of the fourth issue. And uh, it was also, um, we were trying to help promote uh, and give a publication source to the, the, the regrowing SETI and astrobiology and exoplanet community. And I was very happy and proud to work on it. Uh, it was, as I have used to say many times, it was a critical, if not financial success with the astronomy community. So who knows, maybe someone will bring it back someday. But uh, it did last for a while. Uh, got to meet so many fascinating, famous people in the, in the field wrote on a number of different subjects, very important to SETI, and it promoted the growing um, astrobiology and SETI fields. Now, there was, now not everything that happened in SETI in the 90s was, was great, though it was a start. NASA finally got its wish to have a SETI program in 1992. Well, it lasts, and they, what they did was they already had the equipment. They used some of their radio dishes, like the one you see here, uh, that would listen for deep space probes like Voyager and Pioneer. Well, they used them to listen for radio SETI signals. Unfortunately, it lasted a year. Uh, Congress shut it down. There were several congressmen who, um, let's just say, were not, I'll be polite and say, were not very scientifically inclined who uh, did not understand it, thought it was wasting a lot of money, which it wasn't. The budgets were small by any stretch of the imagination and shut it all down. Um, thankfully, it was not the end of the world or the end of SETI by any means because other astronomers took up what set NASA had started and began uh, their own program. One was called Project Phoenix. And, oops, sorry. And uh, there was, and, and they slowly began building up SETI to be owned privately, which actually saved and revived it yet again. So there was that little dip in the road, but it was, it was a dip in the road. It was not the end of the world. Uh, also in the late 70s, uh, this movie came out, called, you may have seen it called Contact. This came out in 1997. Carl Sagan uh, wrote a great novel in his only science fiction novel called Contact, it came out in 1985, and it was turned into a movie in 1997. Um, if you want to get an idea of what SETI was like in the 90s, uh, this will give you a good idea. Um, they, they, of course, in the movie, they got a signal. Uh, did not happen in the 90s or now, but it was. it's nice to see scientists acting like real scientists, seeing how people probably will and would respond to you know, what SETI's all about. And it, it's a well done entertaining film. Uh, I highly recommend it. So as I said, the 90s was another renaissance despite a few bumps. And in the 2000s, as computer technology improved um, and dishes became cheaper and easier to operate, uh, there were projects like this came about uh, in 2007, the Allen Telescope Array the co-founder of Microsoft, uh, the other co-founder being Bill Gates, gave $25 million to get this SETI project going. It is a collection of dozens of radio dishes out in California. You'll notice they're always in remote areas because they try to reduce the amount of signals from Earth. 
And it has been since 2007 with a few bumps in the road financially, it has been looking for uh, SETI radio signals. So in some, you don't always need one giant dish. Sometimes a lot of little ones will do the trick. And here's another close-up picture of it to show you what they look like. Um, I, I'm trying to think how big they are. A person would probably come up to the base there. See where those three struts are holding the, the main bar on one, of the, on one of the dishes? That's about how big they are to a person. They're not very big, but there's a lot of them, and it's powerful. Uh, that's what a lot of people do with optical telescopes now. The, the lenses are getting bigger and bigger. And you can't have one giant lens because it'll collapse under Earth's gravity. So what you do is you make many segments of lenses and you combine them. And then using computers, they can work as one giant telescope. Well, same here. Instead of one giant Arecibo radio telescope, you have a lot of little ones that work together. Um, SETI really got a boost in the 2000s when in 2015, this fellow here on the left, uh, Yuri Milner uh, formed Breakthrough Initiatives. And he, with his own money, uh, it's nice to be a billionaire, with his own money, uh, started off a $100 million fund for uh, conducting SETI and optical in the radio spectrums. And um, his pro he, is, he is definitely, not only has he brought SETI up into the limelight and respectability, He's also, he, he has also gotten all those projects that were all just privately run. They're now helped through his organization so that they can continue, because they used to have a lot of struggles with funding and everything, what have you. And SETI is now finally starting to come into its own, and it's doing more than just sporadic radio searches like it used to. He's also funding uh, something called Breakthrough Starshot. Uh, here's something I thought I'd never see in my lifetime. It's it's far from ready. He is developing a mission to Alpha Centauri, our nearest star system, at 4.3 light years away. He is there. He and scientists are working on a a co collection of light sails, which would be pushed by a giant laser to Alpha Centauri in just 20 years. To give you an idea of how fast, now you might think 20 years for, for four light years away. Well, warp drive hasn't been developed yet. And our current probes, for example, if Voyager was heading towards Alpha Centauri, which it is not, it would take over, even it's one of the, Voyager 1 is the fat, one of the fastest probes we've ever sent. It would take over 77,000 years just to get to Alpha Centauri. So just to give you an idea how big space is, <laughs> but this would, this, his breakthrough star shot, if it can happen, um, the laser light would push the sails to a major fraction of the speed of light, and they would get there in just 20 years, which is remarkable. And what they would do is when breakthrough the probe got there, it would release all these little probes to be spread out. Once again, you don't need one big one, use a lot of the little ones spread out through the Alpha Centauri star system and explore the world there. Um, hopefully the younger folks listening in will actually get to see this launched in their lifetimes and see it make it to Alpha Centauri and we'll have our first direct exploration of another star system. And the nice thing is, if I gave this talk even just a few years earlier, it would all be speculation. Oh, someday we might go to the stars. Well, now we're actually doing, we're, we're not there yet. But we're actually, things are actually happening, and that's wonderful. Now, one of the things SETI is doing is, now remember I said SETI isn't just listening to radio signals anymore? Well, they're also doing something else that was been talked about for years, but is only now being taken seriously. And that's looking for what we call techno signatures. Now, what I mean by techno signatures are, is one thing we've always knew in SETI was the beings that we'd be able to detect, even if they just use radio signals, would very likely have to be more advanced than us. Well, some people have put out there that if there are beings that are way ahead of us because stars form at different times, so evolution happens at different times, 
there are beings out there who might be way advanced beyond us. So one of the theories is that they might want to build structures out of their own solar systems to collect all the energy from their sun. Because right now, less than 1% of the energy that our sun produces falls on Earth, and we use even a fraction of that. Well, when you're a growing advanced civilization, you'll need more energy. So one of the things they thought they could do with their beings would build uh, shells or spheres around their sun to collect all the energy. And they're known as Dyson spheres or more accurately Dyson shells after Freeman Dyson, uh, who unfortunately just passed away recently and was a real innovator in terms of thinking about alien life and, and subjects like this. So here is an artist's representation of what a Dyson shell might look like. Now, the interesting thing is we could detect such things from Earth. Uh, for one thing is the interesting thing is if they enclosed their star, even if they made their star disappear, they would still be glowing in the infrared because they'd have to be getting rid of all the excess heat they're collecting. And we, one, one SETI project that's being, are being, a couple are being worked on is looking for areas in space where there are infrared signatures, but no star. And that could be one possibility is that a, an alien race has built a Dyson shell around their own star. Also too, you would have an incredible amount of land to live on, assuming you're still a biological being and not artificial. Um, having that, you know, building your structure around a star like that with a Dyson shell. Do they exist? We don't know. But um, the interesting thing is Dyson shells were highly hypothetical. Oh, let me, oh, sorry. I should say something. Um, another uh, a rush, uh, I should point out before we go on here, Dyson shells fall under the type two civilization category. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, a guy, a Russian scientist in 1964 named Nikolai Kardashev uh, came up with a scale of how different civilizations would advance as they evolved. And he gave them different types. Now, type one is just a bit above Earth, whereas they're basically utilizing all the energy of their own planet. Type two would utilize the energy of their entire and resources of their entire solar system. That would be a Dyson shell. And then there's the type three, that would harness util and utilize the energy and resources of an entire galaxy. Now, I've often wondered if we're actually in a type three civilization and would we even know it? Um, but I can only imagine beings that could harness and, and, and you know, utilize an entire galaxy for its civilization. But uh, those are the three types and Dyson shells are type two. We're a 0 0.07, we're not even a type one yet. And I don't know if I want to meet a type three. And the funny thing is we could be in the middle of one. I don't even know if we, would we be like ants at a construction site? Do ants know they're surrounded by a giant metal building built by these giant humans with their little colony? Are we like that? And let's just hope we don't get stepped on by human, by the beings that may not even notice us because we'd be so small. Who knows? Well, the interesting thing is we don't know of any type two or type three civilizations, or do we? Uh, in 2015, the Kepler satellite that was looking for planets came across this very interesting object called KIC 8462852, but also known as Boyajian star or Tabby star. Um, there's named after the astronomer uh, Tabitha Boyajian, who in 2015, I think it was 2015, 2015, 2016, wrote a paper that said, uh, Boyajian star seems very unusual. Is it possible that someone's building a Dyson shell around it? Well, as you can imagine, there was quite a reaction. As you can imagine, there was quite a reaction to that in the scientific and community and the media. Now, she was speculating, but she had good reason to speculate because this star system didn't seem to have planets, but it seemed to have huge clumps of matter that were forming around the star and changing shape. 
And one of the speculations was that somebody was tearing their solar system apart and building a Dyson shell around the star, which by the way is about 1400 light years from Earth, which, which means that light, we're seeing things as it were 1400 years ago, or the middle, it'd be the equivalent of the middle ages on, on Earth. Now, what, what happened was the astronomers, of course, doing their job, being scientific, tried to come up with different explanation, natural explanations for, Boy, uh, for Tabby Star. And every one of them, to, to account for the actual data that was recorded, started getting more absurd. They, they were saying giant comets orbit the star, uh, huge planets with immense ring systems, uh, there's giant clouds of dust that change shape and form back. Not implausible, but it was starting to get it. Was, the, it was starting to make the Dyson shell theory not look so bad. So uh, the the point is, we still don't know what's around there. We we're still trying to study it, but it's far away. We're not going to get a mission there anytime soon. And uh, we, you know, we we don't know. Is is it a natural star system just full of dust? Or is somebody building an entire, an advanced species building an entire civilization around their sun to collect all its energy, to power its incredible technology? Um, so that in a nutshell is the history of SETI and where we're at. It's definitely better than it was 20, 30 years ago. And I think it's only gonna get better. And we have not found any signals we, or that we know of, uh, but the day we do find intelligent life, you're, you'll all know about it. And SETI will be transformed from a fringe science into something that is <coughs> one of the most important moments in history. Um, I, I think, I hope you'll agree with me that looking for life elsewhere has always should have been, once we realized such a concept existed, should always have been one of the most important human endeavors because we are one little tiny part or a pale blue dot as Carl Sagan would say in an immense galaxy in an even bigger universe. And if, you know, to think that we're alone, we're the only civilization, the only intelligent beings, it just doesn't jive with, with our modern understanding of what's out there. And it also doesn't jive with science not to look and it's nice to see things are finally starting to turn around. I hope they only get better because I have a feeling we're in for a lot of amazing surprises. And I think, you know, now that we no longer are, are huddled around our one little planet, and we know there's more out there, uh, it only makes sense to look. And that is, um, that is my lecture. And I wanna thank, again, all of you who are attending and listening. And I'm going to uh, bring the podium back to Julia, who uh, I uh, will see if there's uh, any questions on chat or anything I'd love to, I'll try to answer. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, thank you, Larry. Lots of people in chat say clap. Oh, so thank you. You should <laughs> hear this. <laughs> oh, let me, can I get into chat? Yes, definitely. Where, how do I, oh, how do I? Uh, it's chat is near the. Uh, oh, there it is. Share Let screen, me, um, yes. Yep. So okay. lots oh, and lots I'm of I'm going to get my glasses on. Oh, wow. Thanking you, yes. Wow, let me write. <laughs> oh. Oh, oh. Go back. Oh, how do I, how do I go back? Oh, there we go. Yes, yes. Um, so, oh, yes, go. questions, yes. Time for questions, yes, if you have a question. We have a couple of minutes for questions. <laughs> yeah, I want to. Oh, I meant I meant to send that to everyone. Thank you, everybody. How do, how do I write to everybody? I'm getting. You I'm, click on everyone, uh, not is, to a specific person. Everyone in meeting in chat. You see this gray button that says everyone. But oh, I'll do it for you. I, I'm still new with this. Oh, there it is. I got it. Yep. <laughs> Very good. Very good. 
<laughs> I... <laughs> so some people oh, yeah, ask... let me see if I can try to answer. So, yeah, I want to yes. try to answer some questions. Main, might natural selection converge, just a second, on similar solutions on other worlds? So that is now everyone can hear me, right? Everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that is uh, that is what scientists believe. We're, we're hope the, the I mean, we don't there's so much we do not know. But the hope and assumption is that how life here may be similar to how life appears elsewhere, especially on Earth like planets. Will they be like us? Will it be like Star Trek? Everybody's kind of like us, but with funny ears and noses. I don't know, but we'll find out. I think that's one reason SETI hasn't worked yet is because they're so different from us. And they have different, different ways of thinking, different ways to build their civilization. I mean, there's one theory that aliens, would, or beings, when they become advanced enough, build their own virtual worlds, go underground and live their virtual lives rather than have to deal with the real world. Look what we do. Not just because of the pandemic, but we live inside. We play in our computers. We watch TV. We, we already operate in virtual worlds. Now imagine beings that can literally live in their virtual worlds and can't tell them apart from the real one. And if you could make your own fantasy world, would you ever come out? <laughs> <laughs> so there are more questions there. Oh, goodness. So what if they don't have eyes? This is for uh, uh, when we're talking about the golden record images, well, for example, and so on. Oh, well, they can still hear and they can still hear. Um, you know, when they made the record, they did their best and they had to take their chances with certain things. If uh, I assume if beings can't see, but they can still function just like creatures on Earth that can't see, they make up for it in other, with their other senses. You know, the, uh, there may be beings that do just fine without eyes that don't even understand what I, how we see, how that works. You know what I mean? So more questions here. So sure. where does the name alien come from? When was it used first? Uh, um, if you it's, know. It's a version, it's an old word. And it didn't always mean beings from outer space because unfortunately, you know, people in one culture can refer to other cultures as alien. It's, it's a variation of the term foreigner. I, I, I don't know the specifics, but it definitely means foreigner and different. Um, but that's actually a very good question that even I have to look up for the details. So what if they come to Earth one day? Well, I guess we better uh, get out the nice dishes. <laughs> um, it, de it depends how they come to Earth and what they want. Right, right. Who they are, who we are at that time, because we may be different by that time as well, right? You, I mean, think how different we were culturally just a hundred years ago or a thousand, and then look at evolution. Look how different we were not that long ago. In fact, a hundred years ago, um, I could be technically having this conversation but it would be very different. And I guarantee you, it wouldn't be taken very seriously. Though it's funny when Percival Lowell, who was really promoting the Mars, Martian canals and the advanced Martian things back in the late 1900s, 1800s, he was huge. He had, he had lectures sold out. Everybody wanted to know about the, uh, the beings from Mars. So it all depends. Okay, so probably the last question. Sure. Uh, a question about the spacecraft traveling to Alpha Centauri. Yes. How many solar sails would be used, if you know? And they, how would use, they would use, oh, they would use one giant one for starters. And then when it got there, it would be re um, releasing a lot of little probes. Nice. That would be wow. going around. And, you know, the, the thing is, our, our electronics, you know, we can put a lot in a small package. I mean, look what we can do in our cell phones. Look, look how much power we have in our cell phones. Mm -hmm. Well, imagine a thousand cell phones designed to s examine data. You know, nice. so there's going to be nice. one giant solar sail to push to get to use to get pushed out there. There may be more, but the design's still being worked on. 
Okay, well, thank you so much, Larry. This was absolutely fantastic. Julia, listen, Julia, thank you for doing having me on. I really enjoyed this. Um, I, I'm sorry if I couldn't answer. I didn't get a chance to see everyone's questions, but I hope I was at least able to answer some other ones you have. And again, folks, this is what I gave you about SETI is the literal tip of the iceberg. There is so much about SETI to learn. Um, I'm happy to point to show people where there's more information, but you know, but I want to thank you everybody for attending today and everybody please be safe. Um, because you know, if we're going to meet those alien beings, we got to be in good shape. So anyway, but take care and uh, I'll, I'll hopefully I'll talk to you again soon on some other aspect about this. Thank you so much. Thank you, Julia. Thank you. Thank you.